we just implemented a new computer program at work, and it's been a challenging transition to say the least. In fact, one of my co-workers was having a problem with the new system just the other day, and in frustration she said jokingly, uh, wouldn't it be great if only we had some magic words uh, that we could say to fix this thing? I mean, that's about all that's going to fix it, we think, some magic words. I got started uh, thinking about that, and it would be nice, wouldn't it? Don't you wish you had some magic words? Some words that you could say that would open up a door for you in life? Um, magic words that you could speak and solve problems? Magic words that would fix uh, broken relationships? That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? When I was a kid, uh, it was Alibaba. Remember, uh, I think it's Alibaba, the 40 things or something like that? Sesame. Open Sesame. That was his magic words. All the magicians, they have a magic word. They say presto. That's one of them. Oh, abracadabra. They know those all the magic words. Uh, abracadabra. And then about this time of the year, you hear people saying hocus pocus. I don't even know exactly what that, what that means. But uh, wouldn't it be nice to have some magic words? Uh, words that you can speak and they can change your life. Well, I have some words for you like that tonight. In fact, these words are better than magic, really. These two little words, if spoken with sincerity, if they are spoken regularly and if they're spoken with persistence, I believe, I'm learning in my own life, that they will revolutionize our lives as God's people. And I'm talking about real magic here, not the, not the pretend variety. These words can actually change your attitude. I believe these words can turn the most down-in-the-mouth pessimist into a joy-filled optimist. If these words are spoken truly and often, they will cause you to never see life the same again. Your relationships will change. Do you want joy in your life, hope in your life, contentment? Do you want peace, peace of mind, uh, peace with people around you, peace with God? Well, these two words can make that kind of difference in your life. And I'm going to give them to you if you, don't, if you haven't guessed them already. And I want you to write them down because they are very easily forgotten. I have to remind myself of these words quite often, although I have known the power of these words uh, in times past. I keep forgetting, so write these words down. I'm going to give them to you for free, but I promise you they are worth a king's ransom. <coughs> the words are thank you. Thank you. You may think that, well, David's just being over the top the way he always is, but I'm not being over the top here. And you may think I'm joking, but I couldn't be more uh, sincere in what I'm saying. I truly believe that, uh, that many of us would find our lives absolutely revolutionized if we would utter these words, and, and more importantly, if we would develop the attitude behind these words, the attitude of gratitude. But if you would learn to be grateful and speak these words, thank you. If you would speak them regularly, sincerely, publicly, and personally, your life will never again be the same. The world's most unhappy people are the proud, the self-reliant, the selfish people, those who, in a word, are ungrateful. Now, that's true both on the side of uh, the coin where people may have money and material things, uh, those people, they tend to, to think that they got what they got on their own, and so they don't have anyone to think, and they're ungrateful, and as a, uh, as a result, they, they are unhappy. And then on the other side of the coin, people that may not have very much, they're all the time looking at what they don't have, and so they're ungrateful, and they're unhappy. And the key to a different future for you and for me is not for you to get a new car. You may think that that's the answer, a new car or maybe a, a new house or a new job. But I'm telling you that what you need is a new perspective. Right. A new perspective, and that begins with these two words and the attitude behind these two words. Thank you. Now, some religious teachers, uh, they talk about the power that words can have uh, to alter reality. Uh, some of these people teach if you name it and claim it, 
Well, then you can make things happen. Now, a lot of that really is hocus pocus, uh, to be sure. It's nothing but nonsense. That's not what I'm talking about. This is not uh, Joe Olstein speaking. This is not the same old prosperity gospel gimmick that lures people in to false religion. That's not what I'm doing tonight. Uh, I think there's a basic common sense rule that is at work here. Some call it the feedback principle. Let me explain that a little bit, the feedback principle. This is how it works. You talk and you act a certain way. And then that causes you to think a certain way. And then you act and talk a certain way, and it causes you to think a certain way, and the more you think a certain way, the more you talk and act a certain way, and it's just this feedback principle, this loop that's happening, and if your talk is all negative, uh, and you're ungrateful, and you're moaning and complaining and groaning like I do a lot of the times, if you're doing that, then the feedback is you start thinking negatively more, you're ungrateful more, you look at what you don't have, and uh, so you're now talking more and more and acting more and more as a person who's ungrateful, and it's just this uh, feedback <coughs> principle. And, and uh, on the opposite side of that, if you talk positively and you're thankful and you're expressing thanks, you're acknowledging the one who blesses and the blessings that he gives, then you start to think more positively, you become more grateful, and as you become more grateful, you're more aware of the good things in your life. Right. And your life begins to change, and then all of a sudden, because you're changing, people are relating to you differently, circumstances don't look the same anymore as they did, uh, and doors start to open, problems start being solved, relationships get fixed. Next thing you know, uh, you're living the blessed, abundant life that Jesus said He came to give. In my personal devotions, I've been reading through the book of Philippians again. I keep coming back to this little book because it helps me so much, especially when I get down and I, I start thinking negatively. In fact, I'm planning on uh, preaching uh, through this book, passage by passage, in the near future. But Philippians is a letter. That's what it really amounts to. It's a letter that can uh, regularly be uh, noticed from the opening lines of, of the book. But it's a short book, 104 verses in four short chapters, and the Apostle Paul, who is a, mission, a missionary, is writing to Christians in a church that he'd helped to start about 10 years earlier. And this is a personal letter, and these folks that he's writing to, they have been some of the closest, the most loyal friends uh, to him through the years. And so this letter is very passionate that he's writing, and it's filled with expressions of uh, affection and concern. You can see that in verses 7 and 8 of Philippians chapter 1, here where the Apostle Paul says, Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness how greatly I long for all of you with the affection of Jesus Christ. So these Philippians... Uh, uh, Paul, Paul has them in his heart. He loves them very dearly. And so this book is a very positive book. In fact, it's one of the most positive books in the Bible. And repeatedly, Paul speaks of joy and gladness in this book. Now, you can go back and, and do your own research, but some form of those words, joy and gladness, appear over 16 times in this short letter. Now, this is important. Now, hang on here with me. Uh, but here's what is the most striking thing. It's the situation from which this book was written that really gives it its meaning. Yeah. Paul is in jail when he writes this book. This is one of his prison epistles. Now this is not the first time that Paul has been in prison for his faith, but he had every reason to believe that it might be his last time because execution was a very real possibility. Now what happened was his friends at uh, Philippi heard of his plight and they sent a messenger to uh, Paul with a financial gift and an offer for uh, more assistance if it was needed. And so he responds with this letter and it's a letter of appreciation and encouragement. That's what he's doing. He's writing a thank you letter. 
The letter speaks of a faith and a hope that cannot be dampened by circumstances. Paul is saying, although things are not as good for me as perhaps I would like for them to be, I'm acknowledging that things are still yet pretty good. His body may be captive in this Roman uh, jail, but his spirit is nonetheless soaring. We see that later in the book in Philippians chapter 4, verse 12, where Paul says, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every circumstance. Now, Philippians, the book begins with gratitude. He's expressing his appreciation to these Christians at Philippi. That's how the book begins. And then it ends with Paul saying, I have learned in every situation in life, the good times and the bad times, to be content. I don't think that's an accident. That the book ends with contentment and begins with gratitude. You're never going to get to the destination of contentment until you learn gratitude. That's the point of, of the book, really. These opening words are related to the closing conclusion, the secret of contentment. What is it? It's gratitude. It's seeing your blessings and then saying that you're thankful for those blessings. But if you don't see the blessings, you'll never express appreciation for the blessings, and you'll be ungrateful and miserable. So let's explore uh, these expressions of gratitude tonight just for a few minutes. Thank you. Those words may not really be magic, but they are the key that unlocks the door of joy and contentment in your life. Everyone I believe in this room has everything that they need at this very moment to experience what I'm talking about. Joy and gladness and gratitude. You already have the raw materials for that. You just have to recognize it and express it. So there's two steps. Two steps um, to a joy-filled life. The first step requires you seeing your blessings. And the second step requires you saying thank you for the blessings. Let's look at this first step. The first step to this joy-filled life is seeing the blessings that we all have. Uh, just as the old song well expresses, count your many blessings, name them one by one. Uh, count your many blessings, see what God had done. Unfortunately, many of us overlook the real treasures of life when we take such an inventory because when we take an inventory of our blessings, we're usually looking for money and material things. And those are not the real blessings of life. They really are not. Not the great blessings. In fact, I know people that are making money, have material things, have a lot more than me, and they are absolutely unhappy. Many, if not most of the people in the world that are seeking after money and material things are finding uh, that those things are not fulfilling and they do not bring happiness. We tend to major on things, but Paul did not major on things. What Paul did was instead of majoring on stuff or things, he majored on people. Paul re realized that the real, the, the real treasure that we have is found in our friends, our family, our brothers and sisters in Christ. You can have a lot of money. You can have a lot of material things. You can be successful in terms of, of this earthly life. But if you don't have friends and family and brethren to share that with, well, what good is it? Well, it's not any good at all. Now, the Apostle Paul, he majors on people. He's in prison. He has very little prospect of being released anytime soon. And he gives thanks for people. That's where he, that's where he sees his blessings. He knew what a lot of us could stand to learn. You measure true wealth with friendships and family and uh, those who are of like precious faith. <laughs> a man can have all the wealth that this world can offer, but if he doesn't have that, uh, what joy, what happiness can he really have? A, a man is never poor who can count uh, his friends and his family who matter most to him. Our text expresses thanks in three different dimensions. Thanksgiving for past people, thanksgiving for present people, and thanksgiving for uh, future people. Let's just take a look at that because I believe as Paul expressed his thanks for people, we can also express our thanks for people. We can develop the same attitude of gratitude that he had if we just look in the right place. Now, we all have much to be thankful from the past. Look at verse uh, 3 of Philippians chapter 1 here. It's, Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of 
of you. And he's talking about the past here. These people in the past. Now Paul could have been grateful for uh, his parents, I suppose, uh, who may have taught him the will of God as he was growing up. He could have given thanks for great teachers who took him deep into the things of God. He certainly could have given thanks for people like Barnabas. Barnabas was the one who stood up for him when the brethren didn't want to accept him. And uh, Barnabas was an encourager to the Apostle Paul when he was very young in his faith. And no doubt Paul was, uh, he was very thankful for that young, eager student, Timothy, who was willing to uh, take up the torch. But here he's giving thanks for these Christians at Philippi, these Christians that made up the church there. Now these friends had supported Paul and they had loved him from the very beginning. Even when others didn't remember him or his ministry, these people proved themselves to be faithful. They prayed for him. They worried about him. They were consistently encouraging him. And now uh, he is giving thanks about them as he remembers them. And just notice here in this context how many times he uses the word all. Paul had learned to be thankful for all of the people that God had brought into his life, even some who had made a life who had made his life a little bit difficult by preaching the gospel without uh, proper motives. He was even thankful for them. But you see, he's, he's, he is looking at his life, choosing to be thankful for these people in his life, developing this attitude of gratitude even in the midst of difficulty, and that makes all the difference with him. I can, when I read this uh, book, the book of Philippians, thinking about Paul being in jail, I can't help but think about him and Silas in the book of Acts. When they were put in jail once uh, for preaching the gospel, they'd been beaten and they'd been locked up in stocks. And at midnight, you know what they were doing? They were singing the praises of God. That's what they were doing. Um, so I'm telling you, the first step to a joy-filled life is seeing your blessings the real uh, things of value in your life. And all of us, all of us have people in our lives from the past that ought to cause us <laughs> to be thankful uh, regardless of what our present circumstances may be. We all have people for which to be thankful. I was thinking, Wendy and I were talking about it just this afternoon uh, when I first uh, started preaching full time. I've been preaching for a long time and had actually been preaching full-time and holding down a job. But I wanted to do what other gospel preachers do. I wanted to stop working and step out in faith and go preach the gospel and just do that uh, full-time. And uh, so I started looking around. I found a congregation or two, actually, down in Alabama that were willing to give me an interview. And so Wendy and I went down to Alabama. We told uh, her mother and Wendell and some others that we were going. And you'd think that a, a young girl's mother would say, now, I, you, you can't take my daughter away now. You can't, you can't move off to Alabama with my daughter. But Brenda was excited about it and, and encouraged us. In fact, she went with us uh, on our first interviews. Uh, we went down to Coleman, Alabama, and I preached there at a great big congregation. It scared the life out of me <laughs> to look at all these people, this big, huge congregation. I thought, well, I, there's no way I can preach here. They invited me to take that job. And I thought, well, you know, I have to really pray about that. Uh, if they just knew who I was, they would never invite me to come here and preach. Uh, so we went on down to Phil Campbell, and I, I interviewed down there with those brethren. It's a much smaller congregation, but these people loved us in those few days, and we were there so much that uh, Brenda said, you got to come to Phil Campbell. you all got to go to Phil Campbell. And so we did. We packed up, left a nice home, left a good job, went off to preach for less money than what we needed to pay our bills. God took care of us through every bit of that. But you know what? When we went down there, Brenda got in the car with us and went with us that uh, that she went. She, uh, Wendell got a break, and she, she came down and stayed with us for more than a month, uh, cleaning the house. And she met all the members of the church there and uh, got to know them all by name. Uh, she went with us to visit with them, and we ate with them and worshiped with them, and when she left, she cried. And <coughs> she cried. Uh, that may not mean a whole lot to other people, but I thank God that she was a part of our life then. What a, how much that helped me. I hope she knew. And I know there are people like that in your life, people that taught you and loved you and encouraged you and helped you when you needed to 
to be loved and encouraged and helped. And you think money <coughs> is what matters. That's not even close to what really matters. It's those people in our lives that God put in our lives that really matter. That's what makes life worth living. And that's what causes us to really rejoice and to be glad, doesn't it? You have those people too. I guarantee every person in this room can recall faces from your past that have made a difference in your life. I don't know, maybe it was a, a teacher or a neighbor or an elder or a preacher or a, 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 an in-law or, or someone. All of us had that. Paul had that. And it was the memory of those people that caused him to be so thankful. And you th I think that's one of the reasons why we so much dread losing our memory uh, as we get older. In this country, we spend billions of dollars trying to figure out how to keep people remembering. You know, people age and you can't stop that, but you just pray that people can remember. That we can remember uh, people from the past that we love and that loved us. And that's what Paul's saying here. We, we, uh, he's saying, I'm just so thankful for you all when I remember you. So we have much to be thankful for from the past. And we also have much to be thankful for in the present. Look at what he says in verse 4. He says, always in every prayer of mine for you, you all making requests with joy. Now he's talking about his, uh, his prayer life in the present as he's remembering these people. And then in verses 7 and 8, again, look at that. He says... Uh, even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you in all the bowels of Jesus Christ. Now, having talked about our memory of the past, let me, let me just uh, also warn you about a danger that comes with memory because it's possible for us to let the good old days uh, be a shadow over the present. We glorify yesteryear in such an exaggerated way sometimes that the present could never possibly measure up. And there's truth in the, in the good old days uh, that they were good. But... Uh, if you look, you can also see that these are some good days too. If you're looking in the right place. To appreciate the present, we sometimes need to realize how good we really have it right now. That sometimes means acknowledging the alternatives. There's an old Jewish rabbi or, or Jewish uh, story that's told by the rabbis about appreciating what we have, and this is the way it goes. A poor peasant goes to his rabbi with a complaint. He says, life is unbearable. Nine of us live in one room. I can't stand it any longer. What can I do? The rabbi answers, uh, take your goat from the barn. Move it into the house with you. The man uh, is upset by that, but the rabbi insists, do as I have said, come back in a week. A week later, the poor peasant comes back uh, looking uh, more distraught than ever. He says, I can't stand it. The goat is filthy, the goat stinks, the whole house smells like a goat. The rabbi tells him to go home and take the goat back to the barn and come back in a week. A week later, he comes back with nothing but a smile on his face. And he proclaims, life is so beautiful, I can't tell you how much better everything is. What a relief to have that goat gone uh, from the house. Now there's only the nine of us. Life is so good. And I read about that uh, parable and I thought, how many of us need a goat in our house? If you need a goat, I know a couple of guys that can help you out. They'll make you a good deal. Now Paul is in prison. Life wasn't good for him. Nevertheless, he was grateful because he still had friends who cared about him and who were standing by him. And this letter is partly a thank you note that Paul sent to these people at Philippi because they'd sent one of their own to him. And they'd also sent a gift to him. That friendship was a blessing that couldn't be measured in dollars or cents or in any other way. He also speaks here in this context about uh, their partnership in the gospel. Now, 
The word partnership here is the same term that's translated fellowship in other places, but it has a meaning um, that is very special. The word partnership here would be the, the same as if uh, I were to take one end of this table and lift it, and Eddie got up and went to the other side of the table to lift that side of the table. I probably couldn't move that table all by myself, but Eddie could be a partner with me in that endeavor. He could come alongside me, and together the two of us could move that table, uh, could bear that load together. And that's what Paul was saying, and that's what Paul's goal is in the first place, is to preach the gospel, to glorify Christ, to bring others to, a, to a faith, saving faith uh, in him and through him. And Paul's thankful that these people are coming alongside him to help him carry this weight, to bear this burden. So Paul and his Philippian friends share common salvation through their faith in Christ, a common cause because they have a passion for sharing the message of Jesus, a common love because they have a devotion to Christ that has led them to share their time, their treasure, and their talents wherever that might be needed. And they also have this common destiny. They're all headed for a grand reunion one day in eternity. So Paul's grateful for that. Are you... Are you seeing, that's what, I, what I'm asking, are you seeing um, what blessings you have? If you don't see them, you're not going to be grateful. You're going to feel left out. Or in, in your arrogance, you're going to think uh, you're self-sufficient. Either way, you're going to be ungrateful and you're going to be unhappy. The joy-filled life's first step is seeing the blessings that you have. Uh, just look around this room here tonight. Just look at the people. Every, every face is familiar. Every person is here by choice, I would say. Maybe, maybe some of the kids had to be urged uh, a little. But everybody's here by choice. No one was forced physically to come. And there are people here tonight from every walk of life. Uh, we have different backgrounds, but we all have this one common goal, don't we? Uh, to know God better, to seek His will for our lives. And here we are tonight on a Sunday evening, surrounded by people that love Jesus and care about us. Don't tell me. Don't tell me that you don't have anything to be thankful for. I don't hear that. And don't let don't you allow me to tell you that. Because we all have a lot to be thankful for. Well, that's the first thing. Here's the second thing. Uh, I skipped that last part because I'm running out of time here. But I want to get this second step in. The second step to a joy-filled life is saying thank you. You've got to see your blessings. But you also got to say it. You've got to say that you're thankful. And Paul's words here provide two examples of how to, uh, how to go about unleashing uh, the power of thank you in your life. And the first thing is to simply uh, pray uh, your thanks to God. And that's what this text is all about in Philippians chapter 1. Paul here is telling these Philippians that he's grateful for them, but he's actually talking about the fact that he's praying on their behalf. That's what, that's what this text is referring to. And that's the truest test of gratitude. Recognizing that God is the one that has blessed us with these people. Uh, family members, friends, people of common faith. Thanksgiving is the first act of prayer and worship always. And we ought to pray long and we ought to pray often in appreciation for, the, for those people that God has placed in our lives. The very term for prayer found in our text here is not the general word for prayer. The word here means petitions or requests. And so what that is saying is that we pray about the people that God has blessed us with, but not only do we pray about them, but we pray for them. We want God to bless them in the same way that God has blessed us through them. That's what Paul is saying. And we can never, ever, ever pray too much. The great missionary, uh, William Carey, knew this. He once was approached uh, for spending so much time in prayer and neglecting his business. And he replied that supplication, thanksgiving, and intercession were more important than uh, anything else in his life and certainly more important than laying up treasures on earth. And I love this quote. He said, 
Prayer is my real business. Cobbling shoes is a sideline. It simply helps me pay my expenses. He was trying to preach the gospel and he was trying to work and make some money to support that. He said prayer is my real business. Spiritual things are my real business. Not making money. And what Paul's telling us here is that uh, uh, he's thankful for what he has and he's talking to God about it. But not only does uh, he talk to God about it, uh, he tells others. And that's what the letter is about. The immediate context of Philippians 1 is Paul being thankful to God. The greater context of the entire book is a letter of thanks to the people that actually have been uh, helping him. So he's writing this letter to his friends. Uh, this is an example that we can learn from. I thought a lot about this this past week. The power of thank you is truly unleashed when we voice our appreciation to the people who have blessed us. This is the principle of uh, this, this feedback, this loop principle. As you begin to express how thankful you are to people in your life, the more you think in a way that's uh, in keeping with gratitude. And the more gratitude you have, the more you're thanking people, the more you realize how important people are. And uh, you're becoming more grateful. And then you begin to realize how many people there are in your life, and you're more grateful. Let me tell you, twice this past week, I, I saw examples of this. Uh, at the hospital, just the other day, I had a person tell me how thankful they were. A grown man, in fact, with tears in his eyes. It's amazing how a grown man uh, can be brought to tears when he realizes how many friends he has. You know, you get sick, maybe you go to the hospital, people start showing up to visit, and you start getting phone calls and cards, and you realize how many people there are in your life. We were at a funeral just this past week, and uh, someone there was expressing uh, how delighted they were for such a good turnout. Uh, in fact, someone said to me, I didn't expect you to come. I was like, well, man, I don't know you uh, But it, it's a nice, pleasant surprise, isn't it, when you find out that people love you enough to come to you when you're in need, to give you words of encouragement, to hug you, to tell you that they're praying for you, thinking about you. You see, the first step in the process is seeing how you're blessed. The ste second step in the process is expressing it to people. As you express it, you become more grateful. You begin to see how greatly blessed you are. Next thing you know, you've forgotten about what you don't have, materially speaking. One last word here in our text deserves uh, some attention. Uh, you'll notice here that Paul begins this section by saying, uh, he says, I thank God. Uh, so it's actually a little bit more personal today. Paul says, I thank my God. That personal pronoun matters. It matters a great deal because it's not just God. It's my God. I don't know, is He your God? The God of the Bible, the God who is the Father of Christ, the God who in love sacrificed His Son to ransom us from our sin, has given us everything that we need. Can you say He's your God? He's not just the God of my parents. He's not just the God of the Rope Creek Church of Christ. He's my God. Amen. And that's where it starts. This attitude of gratitude and this joy-filled way of living, it starts right there. When Paul says, my God, he's not saying my God in the sense that he is controlling God. It's not like God is a possession to him and He's controlling God, and God has to do what He tells Him to do. When He says, my God, He's talking about, uh, He's speaking in terms of relationship. He's saying, this is my God. I'm in a relationship with Him. I know Him. I love Him. He knows me. He loves me. 
He's not a foreign idea or a foreign God to me. He is my God. That's why he's so thankful to him for these blessings that he has. And that's where it has to start. It starts when we, we realize that the God of the universe has a personal interest in us. He has a personal interest in your life. And we in turn then place our personal faith in him, who he is, and what he can do. This is not a mind ownership, but relationship. We don't control God, but we do submit to Him. And when we submit to Him, uh, we can begin to see the blessings that He wants to shower upon us. And seeing those blessings, we can become thankful. And as we express our thanks, we can begin to experience joy and peace in our lives. In fact, joy and peace that Paul goes on to describe as being inexpressible. Beyond understanding, in fact. I hope that... Uh, that would be the case for you. If you cannot say that tonight, that He's your God, that you are in a personal relationship with Him, that you know Him and are serving Him, uh, you can make that statement true about yourself. It's very simple. The New Testament outlines uh, what you need to do to make Him your God. You need to accept by faith that He sent His Son Jesus into the world and that His Son died for your sins at the cross. You need to believe that God raised Him from the dead and that Jesus is now sitting at the right hand of our Heavenly Father and has all power and authority both in heaven and on earth. And in submitting to Him, obey Him in baptism, you can have your sins cleansed by His precious blood. You can rise from that watery grave of baptism. A new creature with a new life, a new lease on life. Becoming one of God's children and a part of His uh, forever family. And if you've done that and you've turned aside from serving the Lord faithfully, if you need to return back to Him, uh, confess unfaithfulness, sin, whatever is standing between you and God, get that resolved. And if we can help you, let us do that while we stand together tonight. And sing. <laughs>